Hello everyone, welcome to the second Physics 425 lecture. Uh, just by way of review, I've drawn here the Carnot cycle, the Carnot refrigeration cycle. Um, and so this is what we worked on last time. And what we found is that if we could create a cycle in which there were two isothermal processes, one isothermal compression from A to B, and an isothermal uh, expansion from C to D, what we could do is we could extract the heat Q1 from a cold reservoir at T1 and dump some heat Q2 into the hot reservoir at temperature T2. The other two parts of the process were adiabatic uh, compressions and expansions. So the expansion is from B to C and the compression is from D to A. And those parts of the cycle were used just to take us from temperature T1 to T2 and from temperature T2 to T1 so that we could form a complete cycle. Um, what I want to start with today is to try to at least conceptually design a Carnot refrigerator, a practical refrigerator, what would be the required components? And then we'll find that that's, it's actually hard to design a practical refrigerator based off of the Carnot cycle. So what we'll do then is we'll start to consider another cycle, the uh, Stirling cycle, which maybe is conceptually slightly more complicated, um, but can be used to actually build real refrigerators. Okay, so the design of a Carnot refrigerator. Uh, we know there's isothermal processes, so what we need is some kind of thermal link between our temperature reservoirs, our thermal reservoirs, one at T1 and one at T2, and we know that T2 is greater than T1. Um, but there's also adiabatic processes. So for those two steps, we need a way to isolate our system from the thermal reservoirs. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use a system that has some thermal switches. And so here's our container and it's got a piston in it and the piston can move up and down and our gas is contained inside the container like so. Um, and we're going to have a pair of thermal switches. And so I'll draw them as if they look like electrical switches and so here's a thermal switch. We'll call it S1, and then we need another one for the other reservoir. We'll call that one S2. Um, so how could you make a thermal switch? Uh, there's a couple ways to do it. Uh, one way is just to actually have a mechanical switch. So you can use uh, copper, it has a really high thermal conductivity. So if you link the container of the gas to the thermal reservoir using a piece of copper, and then you have a switch to break that link, um, that's one way to thermally link and isolate your system from a reservoir. Um, another thing you could do is you could use some exchange gas. So you can conduct heat uh, through some gas that separates your thermal reservoir and your system. Um, and so there's a variety of options. There's also materials that you can use where you can change the thermal conductivity by a large amount just by applying a static magnetic field. And so you can open and close the switch using an electromagnet. Um, so by turning the current off and on in an electromagnet, you could change by orders of magnitude the thermal conductivity of some material that connects your system to a thermal reservoir. Okay, 
So conceptually, that's what it looks like. Uh, we have a vacuum everywhere um, around our thermal reservoirs and the outside of our system so that it's not interacting with the environment. It only interacts with the reservoirs when the switches are closed. Okay, so a refrigeration cycle. So we know there's four stages. The first one is A to B, and that was an isothermal process. It was an isothermal process at temperature T2. And so if we want our system to be at temperature T2, what we're gonna have to do is close our switch S2. So we're gonna close S2 and then isothermally compress the gas. Okay, so we're using the piston to do work on the gas. Um, so we're doing work on the gas. And last time we calculated that what's going to happen is we're going to have a heat flow from the system to the thermal reservoir. Uh, so we extract heat Q2, let's say from the system, and we dump that into the thermal reservoir. Right, so if we're doing work on the gas, it's gaining energy but we have to keep it at a constant temperature. And so the only way to do that is to have uh, an equivalent amount of energy lost by heat transfer. Okay. From B to C, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have an adiabatic process and it's gonna be um, an expansion. So if we want our process to be adiabatic, we need to isolate it from both reservoirs so there's no heat exchange. And so that means both thermal switches are open. So we're gonna open S2 to isolate the system. And then we can adiabatically expand the gas. Uh, so there's no heat exchange, so the change in, well, dq is equal to zero. Um, we're expanding the volume, so that means the gas is pushing on the piston, so the system is doing work. Um, so the gas does work. It uses some of its internal energy to push on the piston, and that means the temperature must cool. And so the temperature goes from T2 to T1, where T1 is less than T2. All right, in C, or step three, from C to D, that's another, so C to D is another isothermal process. It's an isothermal expansion at temperature T1. So if we want our system to be linked or be held at a fixed temperature, we need to close the switch S1. So we close S1 and then isothermally expand the gas. So the gas does work. It's still pushing on the piston uh, but if we don't want it to cool, then it must be absorbing heat at the same time. And so this absorbs heat Q1 from the cold reservoir so that its internal energy doesn't change as it does work um, at T1. Um, and so remember, this was the important part. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make a refrigerator. We're trying to get our 
temperature T1 to a low temperature and then keep it there. So this is the refrigeration part. Uh, so finally, four is another adiabatic process. And so we want both switch open, both switches open. In the previous step, we closed S1. So now we're going to open S1 to isolate our system. And then we're going to adiabatically compress the gas. If we compress the gas, we're doing work on the gas. The gas is gaining energy. Um, and if it gains energy, its temperature goes up. So we do work on the gas. And there's no heat exchange. So therefore, the temperature increases from T1 to T2. And we're back at our original starting point, and we can just repeat that process over and over again. Um, so although, you know, we could write down in principle what the steps required would be, it's, it's actually the implementation of the thermal switches and the requirement that we have adiabatic processes that makes building a practical Carnot refrigerator uh, challenging. Um, so, you know, especially if you think, you know, going through these processes once a second, then you're gonna have switches that are gonna be, have to act quickly. Um, and so it's, it's not so trivial to imagine how you might do that in practice. The Carnot refrigerator is conceptually simple, but hard to implement in practice. So the question is, can we design Another, another type of cycle that does work on an ideal gas to extract heat from a cold thermal reservoir. And so the answer is yes. And the cycle we're going to talk about is the Stirling cycle. Again, you might have heard of the Stirling cycle in terms of uh, heat engines, where you use a temperature difference to extract work so that you could mechanically move something. But here we're going to talk about using the Stirling cycle for refrigeration. It's the same cycle as the heat engine cycle. We're just going to run it in reverse. Um, so in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to start with some of the same concepts from the Carnot cycle. We're going to use the same isothermal processes where we have two, let me, I'm gonna try to draw this one a bit nicer. Where we're gonna have two isothermal processes. One's gonna be at T2, and this is gonna be at T1. T2 is greater than T1. And we'll have point A. We're gonna do the same isothermal compression. A to B, and we already know what's going to happen. We're going to extract the heat Q2 from the gas, and we're going to dump it into the hot reservoir. We've already calculated what Q2 is. And then we're going to also use the same isothermal expansion from C to D. 
and we again know what's going to happen. We're going to take heat from the cold thermal reservoir Q1 and it's going to be absorbed by the gas. The difference is now that we're not going to use a adiabatic process where remember for an ideal gas uh, we would require PV to the gamma equals a constant. So P is proportional to V to the gamma minus 1. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to try to have a process in which there's no change in volume. And to complete the cycle, we'd need another one of those to go from B to C. Um, so if we were to call this volume VA and this volume VB, a constant volume process is an isochoric process. So we're going to have these two isochoric processes. And we already know what's going to happen with the isothermal processes. So we just have to analyze uh, the two constant volume processes and see what happens. OK, so let's just remember some of the results that we already have. I've already analyzed the isothermal processes, which were A to B is the compression, and C to D is the expansion. So in A to B, we know that the work was NKBT ln of VB over VA. VA is the higher volume. And so VB over VA is less than 1. Ln of a number less than 1 is negative. And so we get negative work by the gas. So that means it's a compression. So we're doing work on the gas. And so Q2 uh, goes from the gas to T2 reservoir. Uh, when we do C to D, it looks the same except for the ratio of volumes is inverted. And that means we get positive work by the gas and the heat flow is in the other direction. Positive work by the gas. Q1 goes from T1 reservoir to the gas. OK, and we've already drawn those heat flows on our diagram. All right, so as we already said, what's left to do is to analyze the constant volume processes. So what about the isochoric? processes our constant volume. OK, well, for an ideal gas, we already know that the change in internal energy is determined by the heat absorbed by the gas and the work that's been done. Um, however, there's a simplification because the work dW is PdV. But we're dealing with constant volume, so dV is zero. There's no change in volume, and so there's no work. And so the change in internal energy is just equal to dQ. But calculating the change in internal energy is really easy, right? Because it's just uh, F over 2, the number of degrees to freedom, divided by 2, and kBT. Um, so for B to C, let's just go look at our cycle. B to C starts at T2 and goes to T1. 
Okay, so the change in internal energy is the final internal energy at T1 minus the initial internal energy at T2. So delta U is the number of degrees of freedom divided by 2 nKb times the change in temperature. But in this case, the final temperature is T1. The initial temperature was T2. T1 minus T2 is less than 0. And so therefore, if dQ is the amount of heat absorbed by the gas, then if we have a negative amount of heat, the gas must lose that heat. So the gas loses heat Q. Um, so what we could do is we could go to our diagram and a gas losing heat, we'll draw that as a heat flow out of our enclosed uh, loop. All right, but when we go to D to A, delta U is calculated in the same way. We have the same two temperatures, T1 and T2. It's just now that T2 is the final temperature and T1 is the initial temperature. And so we just reverse the order of the temperatures when we take the difference. And we'll get some heat Q prime that's going to be positive. And in fact, Q and Q prime are the same size. They're just different signs. Um, so a positive heat is a heat that's been absorbed by the gas. And let's just make the note that Q prime is just a negative of Q. And so to complete our Stirling cycle diagram, we need to indicate that in the process from D to A, a heat Q is absorbed by the gas. Okay, so the obvious question then is um, where does the heat either go to or come from during the isochoric processes uh, B to C and then D to A. For the isothermal processes, it was pretty obvious that what we would need is a thermal link to our thermal reservoirs. And if there was a heat exchange, that heat exchange would be with the reservoirs through the thermal link. Um, but the Stirling cycle is a little bit more complicated. And so the Stirling refrigerator... requires an extra component. Um, I'm going to call the Stirling refrigerator a cryocooler now. That's the common language that would be used if you were shopping for this type of device. You would look for a Stirling cryocooler. Um, and what it requires is something called a regenerator. What the regenerator does is it it's used to temporarily store heat from that's uh, released by the gas and then to give that heat back during a different part of the cycle. So a regenerator is used to temporarily store heat absorbed from the gas and then to release it 
back to the gas. So the stored heat that would be released by the gas would be Q. And then the heat that's released from the regenerator back to the gas is Q prime. And so they're the same amount of heat. The sign just tells us uh, which direction that heat flow is. And so, so like we tried to do for the Carnot cycle, we can try to design a practical Stirling cryocooler. So one simple version of a Stirling cryocooler is a design that uses two pistons. Okay, so let's try to draw this. I'm going to draw a long tube. So this is a cross section of a tube. And then we're going to have a pair of pistons. So these pistons obviously can slide uh, left and right. I'm going to call this piston P2. This is going to be the hot end. And it's at temperature T2. And then over here, we have another piston. Also slides left to right. I'll call this piston P1. And this is our cold end at temperature T1. Um, inside here, we're going to have like a porous plug. And so maybe this is a plug that has like some little fine holes drilled through it. And then over here, we have a second porous plug. So porous plug just means it's a solid wall, but gas can flow through these plugs. Okay, and then between these porous plugs is where our regenerator material is going to be. So I'll draw it as a kind of hatched red region. What the regenerator is, is it's another porous material, uh, but it's designed to have a high heat capacity. So that means, what does heat capacity tell us? It tells us uh, regenerator. Heat capacity tells us uh, how much heat we have to add to a material to change its temperature. So if we have a high heat capacity, then what we need to do is we need to give a lot of heat to change its temperature. Another way to think of it is if we have some material with a very high heat capacity and we want it to absorb, say, a small or moderate amount of heat, its temperature won't change much. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this regenerator to absorb and release heat. But when it either absorbs heat, it doesn't heat up much. And when it releases the heat, it doesn't cool down much. So it stays at about the same temperature. Um, so for our regenerator, what it can do is gas can pass through. And and it has a high heat capacity. You know, one way to make a regenerator is just to get some fine mesh material, like maybe some st stainless steel mesh uh, or stainless steel wool or something, and kind of pack it densely between these two plugs. And so you have a, a large mass of material, so it's got a high heat capacity, but it's a mesh, um, so gas can flow through it easily. So what this high heat capacity really means is that uh, the material can absorb, store, and then release heat without 
significant change to its temperature. All right. So um, let's just take a look at this. Uh, what we've got here is our gas inside of our system. Let's make our gas particles blue. They're going to be in this region here where some of it's in the regenerator. Um, but in a practical design, what you would try to do is when you're in this configuration where the piston P1 is to the left as much as it can go, and the piston P2 is also to the left as much as it can go, most of the gas is sitting here in the hot end. Um, and so that means in our cycle, we're somewhere along the T2 curve. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to move the piston P2 to the right, and that's going to compress the gas. It's going to reduce the volume. So what we've drawn here is the configuration of our system when we're sitting at point A. And so this drawing corresponds to point A in our Stirling cycle diagram. So this corresponds to point A on the PV diagram. And so let's just go through and see how we could execute the complete cycle. Sterling refrigeration cycle. Okay, step one is to go from A to B. And that's an isothermal compression. So we're going to keep P1 all the way to the left and we're going to move P2 to the right so it's going to compress the gas but the gas predominantly stays in the hot end so it stays it maintains its temperature at T2 while it gets compressed so we use P2 to compress the gas in the hot end So this is a constant temperature, constant temperature at T2. Uh, we keep P1 stationary. So there's negative work by the gas, or we're doing work on the gas by compressing it. And so Q2 goes from the gas to the reservoir at T2. So we're doing work on the gas. It's gaining internal energy. If we want its temperature to stay constant, then we have to uh, have... So it's gaining energy. If we want to keep the temperature fixed, we have to lose energy by uh, releasing some heat. Okay. And step two is B to C. So this is a constant volume process. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting case because how could we have constant volume? Well, we could have constant volume by moving neither of the pistons, but that's not very interesting. So what we're going to do is we're going to move the pistons in tandem. If one of them is moving to the left, we'll move the other one also to the left at the same rate so that there's no net change in the volume of the gas. So here's our regenerator material. Uh, let's see, here's piston P2. We were already moving P2, in fact, to the right. 
weren't we? So P2 was already moving in this direction because we were compressing our gas. What we're going to do is we're going to take P1 and we're going to start to move it also to the right at the same rate. And then you can see what's going to happen is the total volume of the gas is not changing. We're just moving that gas, which was originally all stuck in the hot end at T2, and we're moving it over to the cold end. And so we move P2 and P1 simultaneously to the right. And what this does is it pushes the warm gas through the regenerator to the cold end. And if we want to have our gas change temperature from T2 to T1, it's got to be releasing heat because there's no work being done. So the only way it could lose energy um, to lower its temperature is by releasing heat. And what it does is it releases heat to the regenerator as it passes through. So uh, gas cools from T2 to T1, and we get heat released to the regenerator. Okay, the third step is C to D. Um, and so look, let's look at C to D. Where is our cycle? C to D is an expansion of the gas, an isothermal expansion. So if we want it to be isothermal at T1, we will want to have pushed all of our gas into the cold end and so that means piston P2 should be right up against the porous plug that's on the left-hand side. And if it's an expansion, we're going to keep moving piston P1 to the right. And so here's our porous plug. And here's our piston P2 right up against that plug. This is temperature T2, this is P2. Uh, we have another porous plug over here. And we want to be expanding our gas, so we're going to keep moving P1 to the right. This is our temperature T1. And what else do we have to draw here? We draw our regenerator material. And we're going to have our gas, which is moving into the cold end of the Stirling cryo cooler. Okay, so in words, uh, we keep P2 stationary. We expand the gas isothermally at temperature T1 by moving P1 to the right. The gas is doing work because it's uh, pushing on the piston P1. The gas does work. Um, and so in order for it not to cool as it uses some of its energy to do work, it must be absorbing heat, and so it absorbs heat Q1 from the thermal reservoir T1. So Q1 from the reservoir T1 goes to the gas. Okay, and so finally, we need to get back to our starting point. 
And so that's the fourth part of the cycle. It's another constant volume part. And so what we know is that in order to do a constant volume process, as we've already seen, we're going to move the pistons in tandem. So we'll draw this one more time. Here's our long tube in cross-section. We've got two plugs. What we need to do is we need to go from T1 back to T2. And so that means we're going to be pushing the gas out of the cold end. And so we'll move our piston P1 to the left. And to make it a constant volume process, at the same time, we'll move piston P2 also to the left. And that's going to push the gas back through the regenerator. Remember, the regenerator has previously stored an amount of heat from absorbed from the gas. And what we're going to do is we're going to recover that heat. Um, so our gas is going to be moving from the cold end back into the warm end. So we move P2 and P1 in tandem to the left. We push the cold gas through the regenerator to the hot end. The gas warms from T1 to T2. And so it warms not because there's any work being done, because the change in volume is zero. It warms by absorbing heat. The heat Q that was previously stored in the regenerator during the B to C process. Okay, and so now we're back at our starting point and we just repeat the cycle over and over again. Um, so, What I think I'm going to do is um, I'm going to make an assignment related to the Stirling uh, refrigeration cycle. And what you're going to do in this assignment is you can you can represent this cycle using not a PV diagram, but an entropy temperature diagram. And so I'm going to have you analyze the Stirling refrigeration cycle in terms of entropy and temperature and also have you calculate the coefficient of performance for this cycle. Um, we did that calculation for the Carnot cycle, so how does the Stirling cycle compare uh, to the one that we've already analyzed? Okay, great. Thanks very much, and until next time.